two weeks, uh, three weeks ago, I preached a sermon called uh, The Battle for Our Children. Some of you are here and remember that sermon. And I told you that I have two parts to that sermon. So today I'm preaching the second part of that sermon. And I entitled my sermon this morning, Little Disciples. Um, if, if you remember last time when I preached, I asked you this question. The enemy has a plan for your children, do we? Do we have a plan for our children? And that's, that's, a, that's a very deep question, and we need to really think about that question. And we looked at the strategy that God gives us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9, about the strategy how we can battle the enemy for our children. And uh, today's sermon, I'll just continue with part two of that. The theme of month of June is what? Discipleship and Christian education discipleship so today that's why i entitled my sermon little disciples because i want to talk about how we can make disciples out of our children we always think discipleship is for whom for the adults we always try to disciple the adults but we always ignore and forget to disciple our children and that's a very important thing that we need to remember Christian education, when we think about Christian education, we think about what? Uh, CWAA, we think about Berman University, we think about our schools and churches maybe. But where should Christian education start? You guys all know that. I don't even have to preach, but do we really practice that? And that is the question. We always associate discipleship with the adults. We always associate Christian education with our schools and, you know, and our churches. But we have to remember that the Christian education discipleship starts at home. The story is told about a famous preacher, Dwight L. Moody. Some of you heard about Dwight L. Moody. <clears throat> he had an evangelistic series, and he returned back to his uh, home church and one of the members asked him, uh, were there any souls, any people saved during your series? And he said, yes. He said, two and a half people. And the person looked at him and smiled, you mean two adults and one child? And he said, no, he replied, two children and one adult. Why did he say that way? Two lives saved were those of children because they have they gave their life to Christ when they're young and they have their whole life ahead of them to dedicate it to serve God a half life is the older person that has only a little left to serve God with his life that's why Dwight L Moody said there was two and a half two children and one adult saved the great commission in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, says what? Go and make what? Disciples of all nations. Now, we usually exclude children from this. We go overseas. We go to, you know, different places in the world to preach the gospel. We do evangelistic series and spend a lot of money, which is not bad. I mean, to do evangelistic series, not to spend a lot of money, all right? Don't I misunderstand me. But those are good things, but... The Great Commission includes our children as well. Jesus is saying here to the disciples and to us today as a church, go make disciples of your children. Remember in the last sermon I said one interesting phrase, instead of including our children in the Great Commission, we practice what? Great omission. Instead of including our children in the Great Commission, we practice great omission. So we have to be very, very careful with that. Before we move on about discipling children, I would like to define why discip what discipleship is. How many of you know what discipleship is? Just anybody has an idea what discipleship is? Some timid hands go up like this. <laughs> Following Jesus, yes, that's very, very simple. Another simple, I want to keep it very simple. It's very, very simple. Remember this, discipleship is having a relationship with Jesus. That's it. It's the relationship between the teacher and the student, right? That's a discipleship process. It is a relationship. So if you forget everything today from what I said, remember, discipleship is a relationship. So the question is, can our children have a relationship with Jesus? Yes, yes they can. 
So that means they can be disciples, right? If they can have a relationship with Jesus, if we can lead our children into a relationship with Jesus Christ, they can become disciples. The important point I want to mention this morning is, because discipleship is a relationship, we must be very careful when we disciple our children. If you want your children to take on your values and your faith, then you must transfer, transfer those values in a context of what? Of a relationship. Anytime we pass down rules, practices, or truths outside of the context of a genuine relationship, we just establish an empty religion. I want you to remember that. There is a lot of children that come to church and you think as parents and as adults in the church, you think you are discipling them and growing them to be genuine Christians, but we are passing to them what? Rules, regulations, and we forget about the relationship. And that's why those kids acquire an empty religion. I've talked to one one a young adult in the church that left the church. I met with him over lunch. Uh, he used to be in the youth group when I was the youth pastor. And I talked to him and uh, I asked him, what happened that you left the church? The number one thing he told me, too many rules. <laughs> That's how he saw it. It doesn't mean that it happens with everyone. It was for him, that was his experience. So, I'm not saying the rules are bad, but if we just transfer rules and regulation on our children, we're just passing on to them what? An empty religion, and the children will eventually leave the church. So I want you to remember this, discipleship. When you try to disciple your children, it must happen in a context of a relationship. Let me present to you some statistics from Barna Research that are very important and they tell us why discipling children is so important in, in, in today's world. This is from 2003, the statistics. Barna did a research and he said this, he found out this, probability, maybe you heard this, of someone embracing Jesus as his or her savior is 32% between ages five and 12. Between ages 5 and 12, the openness of the children, they accept Christ so much more eagerly than, than the adults, 32%. Between ages 13 and 18, it goes down to only 4%. So if we wait until they're in early teens or in ju juniors or early teens or in youth and try to do that, it's what? It's too late sometimes. The probability of them accepting Christ and staying in the church goes down to 4% between ages 13 and 18. And then it's even worse. I mean, a little bit better between actually ages 19 and older, it's about 6%. When they're in youth and young adults, it's about 6%. But comparing to 32%, it's a big difference, right? 4% and 6%. So is it important to disciple our young children? Absolutely. And we as a church have missed that window of, of opportunity sometimes. Have you heard about a missiologist by the name Louise Bush? He developed this concept about 1040 window. You heard about the 1040 window? He developed that concept. It's a 1040 window. It's, you know, it's in Southeast Asia and in Asia Minor there and South, uh, uh, Northern Africa. It's, you know, the geographical area where there is a lot of work to be done, okay? There is not too many Christians, so he developed that. But lately, he came up with a different window, and he calls it 414 window. 414. This means that children, this is about the children. It's the window of opportunity for the children to accept Christ between ages 4 and 14. And he says that's a more strategic window than the 1040 window. And he encourages and he calls the Christians, he says, he's calling the Christian to recognize the critical value of 414 window. If we neglect it, he says, an entire generation could be lost. Remember, the 414 window, it's very, very critical in the churches and in our families. I want you to open with me your Bibles in Judges chapter 2. 
During my devotionals, I read through Judges right now. It's an interesting read. And you know what? As I was putting the sermon together, I was trying to actually take in a different direction, but then I read this verse and everything changed, okay, so from this point on. Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2 and verse 10. In verse 7 and 8 and 9 talks about the death of Joshua, okay? That's the leader, and he dies. And in verse 10 it says, When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, I mean all the generation passed away, another generation arose after them who what? Did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. That was stunning for me when I read this verse. After Joshua passed away and that generation passed away, there was a new generation, the young children, a new generation rising that didn't know the Lord. So what happened there? The answer is that the previous generation, Joshua's generation, failed to introduce God to this new generation. It was a failure on the previous generation. They failed to fulfill God's command from Deuteronomy 6. You remember we read last time, teach them all the time. That's what God told that generation, to teach their children about God. So this generation, they failed to do that. Now, when it talks about knowing God in the Bible, that means what? Having a personal relationship. Remember, discipleship is what? A relationship. Knowing God. When it says here that the previous generation didn't know God, it means they did not, they did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There are so many children today that know about God, but they don't really know God personally. And that's a big difference. That's why I said it must be a discipleship process. It must be a relationship. Otherwise, it's just an empty religion. We bring them to Sabbath school. We take them to our church school. We do this and do that with them. They're learning a lot about God, but they are not learning to have a relationship with God. And that is the problem that we encounter today. It is interesting to see that the previous generation, if you read through Joshua, the book of Joshua and Judges, the previous generation, that's Joshua's generation, they were busy doing what? Fighting for the promised land, right? The generation was busy. They were fighting for the promised land. They were busy doing God's work. That's what God told them to do, to go and take the promised land. They were busy doing things. My question is, why then they failed with their children? Well, one obvious answer is that they were very busy. <laughs> don't we have the same excuse today? Parents, church, don't we have the same excuse today? We are busy with things. These are the immigrants. They just came into a new country. They had to settle in. They have to build up their family. They had to conquer the land. They were busy doing things. I'm talking to a lot of immigrants here probably, right? <laughs> People that came to this new country that had to start life from the beginning, from scratch. We don't have time for our children. We have to work three jobs, you know. We have to make the money to feed our family. We have to build up our family. But while we're doing that, we're forgetting the most important thing. And what is that? Our children, to build up our children. As you can see, Joshua and the previous generation were doing great things. And today we might say the same thing. We're fighting the good fight of faith. We do good things for others, dedicate time for church activities, do door-to-door -door evangelism, trying to save souls. And at the same time, we are too busy to fight for our children. And what have we accomplished? What good was the land to the Israelites, the promised land, if their children who inherited the land did not know God? The same way today, what good is to save our lives and be in the promised land if we lose our children? These are some hard questions, and I want you to 
I don't want you to misunderstand me. There are different circumstances in life. And I know some parents are sitting there today and say, I've done everything possible, and they still left the church. I'm not putting the blame on you. I want to see what we can do now with the children that we have now. I'm not going to the past and see what happened in the past, even though all we can do for those that left to pray for them to come back to God. But I want to know what we can do as families, as homes, and as a church, what we can do for the children that we have today. Amen? We want to know what we can do better to pass on faith to the next generation. After we read that, in, in verse 10, after we read that next generation didn't know God, the book of Judges starts what I'm calling the cycle of dysfunction. <laughs> there is a verse, you go verse 11, right away, right after verse 10, verse 11, it says, Then the children of Israel did what? Evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. This verse is repeated numerous times in the book of Judges. If you read through the book of Judges, it's found in verse, chapter 3, verse 12, 4, verse 1, 6, verse 1, 13, verse 1. All through, there is a cycle of dysfunction that is being established here, and it starts where? In verse 10, because the previous generation didn't know God. That's why the cycle of dysfunction comes in. And how does it work? That's how the book of uh, Judges explain, explains. Is, uh, Israel does what is evil in the sight of God. God allows other nations to conquer them and subdue them. Then Israel does what? They cry out to God. God sends a judge to save them. They're happy. And then immediately it says again, and then Israel fell back into the same thing, the cycle of dysfunction. Immediately after they're saved, it says they, they have maybe peace for about five years, sometimes seven years, and then they fall back into worshiping idols and forgetting about God. Why is that happening? The answer is in verse 10. The generation that arose did not know God. That's why this cycle of dysfunction has been introduced in Israel. The previous generation, as I said, was too busy doing things, conquering Canaan and building their homes and future for their families as they thought, but they were too busy to build up their children, and they ignored fighting the enemy for their children, and the next generation grew up dysfunctional. As you all know, there are some psychologists there probably, it is much harder to undo a dysfunction than to prevent it, right? <laughs> It is so much harder to undo that than to prevent it. It takes only one generation to bring in the, the cycle of dysfunction, but takes a few generations to reverse that cycle of dysfunction. So I'm asking you the question, what kind of generation are we raising here? What kind of generation are we raising here in our church? This is a very important question. I want you to think about it. Are we raising a generation that knows God, that has a personal relationship with Him, or a generation that doesn't? Some of us might be succeeding in many areas of our lives, but the question is, are we successful in discipling our children? Francis Chan says this, Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Did you hear that? Our greatest fear should not be of failing because we will fail. And some of us will fail with our children in this process of discipleship. Jesus chose 12 disciples and it seemed like he was a complete failure with them, right? For three and a half years trying to teach them and lead them and it seemed like complete failure, but he didn't give up on them. At times it will seem like we fail with our children, but it's better to fail that way trying with our children than to do things well where it doesn't matter. If you're successful in your personal life, I mean you're successful in your finances and you're rich and all that stuff, you have a great career and job, that's important. But is that the most important thing? It's not. And the, the generation of Joshua forgot about that and they paid the price, a very heavy, heavy price. In order to raise a generation that knows God, we must start discipling our children at very early age. The responsibility of discipling children 
lies on the adults. Discipling children is not an easy task, is it, parents? <laughs> it's not an easy task. That's why God put on earth two institutions that he wants them to combine their efforts in order to accomplish this hard task. And these two institutions are what? The home and the church. It has to be a combination between those two. And for the rest of the sermon, I want to talk about this combination. And because sometimes we have some misunderstanding who has the primary responsibility and who has the secondary responsibility. Uh, the primary responsibility, you, know, you all know, lies on whom? On the home, on the family. Unfortunately, many parents have relinquished their rights to be the primary spiritual educators of their children. To whom? To the church. Or oh, we have a youth pastor. <laughs> we just talked about the youth pastor. You know, I was a youth pastor here for five years, and uh, I had some parents come and ask me, Pastor, what happened? Why did my child leave the church? And I would answer to them, I have them one hour a week. You have them how many hours? More than that. You know, um, one actually pastor did, he did uh, the calculation. He said this, did you know that the average child spends about 40 hours a year in the church? Just 40 hours on average. But they spend with their parents over 3,000 hours. So who has the greatest influence? The parents. You can't expect us to do in one hour what you can do in 20, 30 hours that week at home. But this is what's been happening in our churches. The parents expect the spiritual professionals, the pastors, the teachers at the school, to take over their responsibilities. And a lot of parents relinquish those responsibilities. The church comes alongside, the school church comes alongside parents to help them out in this great responsibility. But a lot of the parents have it backwards. I was reading this material, and one author calls this Google Parent, Google Parenting. And I'll tell you why he does that. When you want to know something, where do you go to find out the information? On whom do you rely? On Google. You Google it, right? Because you want Google to do the job for you. The same is Google Parenting. You want to rely on someone else to do the job for you. And there is a lot of Google parents out there. <laughs> there is a lot of Google parenting out there. And that is the problem in our church. When it comes to their kids, these parents rely on someone else to do their job. The, the parents cannot afford to do that. You as parents, as family members, grandparents, and extended family, you have the greatest influence on those children. Someone said we live in the world that we love to outsource things, right? Everything is being outsourced. And parents today, they're used to dropping their children at soccer practice, piano lesson, swimming lesson, everywhere. They just drop them off, let them take care of, of those kids for an hour. I'll come back, pick them up, go somewhere else, drop them off. We are outsourced even our children today. <laughs> That's called outsourced parenthood. We must be careful not to outsource the discipling of our children to the spiritual professionals. We are helpful here as pastors. Don't misunderstand me. The elders and the church is helpful. The school is helpful. But parents, families, make sure that you become the primary educators of your children. Make the time to do that. And I know that sometimes it's hard to find that time. Now, just to switch a little bit, and then we'll come to that questionnaire that I mentioned in the, in, the, in the bulletin. I'm doing my doctorate in this area, all right? That's why I'm so passionate about this. I'm doing my doctorate. Uh, my dissertation is called Reaching Families with Young Children in Calgary, Alberta, How We Can Reach Families with Young Children. Uh, as a church, we have been doing a very bad job at that. Um, our evangelistic series doesn't attract young families. If, you, if you've seen, that's not the way to attract families with young children. So we have to rethink the strategies, how to work there. I think I've checked the statistics in Calgary Central. In the last 10 years, 
I think we had one family joining from outside, getting baptized, joining our church by baptism. We had a lot of them transferring in. But to bring a family from outside, I think it was only one family with two young boys that they joined our church in the last 10 years. So it tells me that we have some work to do there, right? So in my doctorate dissertation, my, my doctor dissertation is based on a project. I have to do a project as well, a community outreach project. So what I'm trying to do, working with these statistics, and I have the statistics from around here. I put the statistics together of our uh, Briar Hill community here around the church, and I took five communities around, just five. I didn't take many others. We have about 900 children in this community between ages 5 and 10, all right? And we haven't done any, anything really much to attract those children to our church with their families, have we? So I said, you know what? This will be a great opportunity for us as a church to do something. So as my, my project, I, I thought about starting and operating a children's center from here, from Calgary Central. To have a children's center where children from the community can come and learn more about God and play together and have fun together. And through that, when you respond to a need of a parent, and the greatest need of a parent is what? Ch their children. Believe me, I'm a young parent. I, I'm a young parent and I know if you care for my children and you make them welcome, you can win the parents over as well. All right. So I was thinking about this as I was reading all this stuff and researching. I said, we have some work to do. So at this time, I need some feedback from you as a church. Okay. I need some feedback from you as a church because this is my main premise for this project. There are many children in our church that have parents and grandparents here that can disciple them. But what about the children in the community that don't have Christian parents? Who is responsible for them? Do you think that we as a church are responsible for those children? That's my premise. That's my foundation of my project. I do believe that as a community, we are responsible for those children don't, that don't have anyone to disciple them in God's way. So we as a church have that responsibility. That's why it's my passion to have this children's center where the kids can come and be disciple in God's ways. Amen? But I want some feedback from you. So take about two minutes. It's multiple choice questions there. It's not very hard, you know, multiple choice. I tried to be very clear there. There is one question that is number, I think, number three. If there were a strategy in place to reach this segment, meaning the young kids, would you be interested to help? If you say yes, put your name and a phone number so I know who that is, if you're interested to help with that. When you're done, please pass them to the sides at the ends of the road and the deacons. If you have some, need some pens, our deacons have them. When you're done, pass them to the end of the row and the deacons will pick them up. Let's take about two minutes. We'll have some music in the background. And uh, please participate with me in this. I need your help. Some feedback from you.
All right, thank you. Thank you for doing that. I'll let you, I'm just going to continue. I'm going to conclude for about five minutes. As if you haven't had the chance to pass it to the deacon, you can give it at the door to the deacons or to me. And if you're really interested in doing something, you know, in this area, talk to me afterwards. Talk to me afterwards. And we, uh, we have, I'm very excited to, to, to do that. So anyway, let me conclude with some, uh, some history here, some historical statistics. Not statistics, but historical facts. John Knox, in, in 1600s, it became common practice for the church leaders, just listen to this, it's very interesting. It became common practice in 1600 for the church leaders to go from home to home to visit and see if parents have worship with their children. <laughs> they were going from home to home, the church leaders, we're not going to do that, but it would be nice to take all the elders and send them out. But it was the, the, the practice, they were going from home to home, and they wanted to see if the parents are discipling their children through family worship. In 1647, believers in Scotland published the Directory for Family Worship, in which they wrote that the parents who failed to do family worship, they would be subject to church discipline. <laughs> That's how serious they, those people were about discipling their children. I see some of you, ooh, you know, <laughs> that hurts. In 1647, the church in Scotland, they were very serious about that. Why? Were they so serious about this? Why did they invest so much time going from home to home to encourage and ensure family worship was taking place? Why? Because family worship was a top priority for them. Because they were passionate about the Great Commission and they knew the Great Commission to make disciples began with the children. You start the Great Commission in, their own, in your own homes. That's why the church in Scotland was so passionate about this. For them, a church could not be serious about the Great Commission if it was not serious about family worship. In 1700s, I'm just giving you a quick history here. Jonathan Edwards said, every Christian family ought to be, as it were, a little church. He also said that if children grow up with active discipleship in the home, it is likely they will follow God all the days of their lives. It's not a guarantee. I want to make sure that you understand that. It's not a 100% guarantee, but it's a high, um, high chance, likelihood that they will. In the late 18 and 19, uh, early 1900s, this trend of family worship started to change. The Industrial Revolution came in, parents start working outside of homes. The mothers begin having jobs outside of the home. So this introduced a new trend. Family worship disappeared from homes. And the parents began relying more on whom? On the paid professionals, the schools, the teachers, and the pastors to do the discipling of their children. So in 1800s, um, and, you know, uh, Charles Spurgeon, most of you heard about Charles Spurgeon. He was deeply concerned about this trend, about this change. And in his article, The Kind of Revival We Need, he said, we deeply want a revival of family religion. And then he said, how can we hope to see the kingdom of our Lord advance when his own disciples do not teach his gospel to their own children? How can you expect the kingdom of God to come and the Great Commission to be taken out and be fulfilled if you as a disciple of Jesus Christ do not disciple your own children. If you forget everything from this sermon I said today, I want you to remember one thing. The home must become a discipleship center for our children. <laughs> the home and the church as helping the home must become a discipleship center for our children. Let me conclude with this. When uh, um, Hammon, Harmon Kilbaugh was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1984, he said this thing in his speech. My father taught me and my brother to play ball in the, in the front yard, he said. 
And he said, one day my mother came out and told him we were ru uh, ruining the lawn. And the father replied, we are raising kids, not grass. <laughs> Good answer. As parents and church, we must have an ultimate goal in mind for our children. And everything we do for them should be done with that goal in mind. Our goal, goal should be raising disciples, not just raising kids, not just raising children. Our goal must be raising disciples for Jesus Christ. Amen? That should be our goal. We, you all know Mark 10, verses 13 to 16, when the children were coming to Jesus, disciples did what? They stopped them. It says there that the, the families and somebody brought them to Jesus and the, and the disciples were stopping them. And this text is talking about the necessity of the children to be brought to Jesus, to establish a relationship with him. But don't misunderstand me. There will be barriers. Even the adults, the disciples themselves were stopping. They were standing in the way of the children to come and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then Jesus said this famous phrase, let what? The the children come to me. In other words, Jesus is saying to us today as parents, grandparents, adults, the whole church, he's saying to us today, bring the children to me because I want them to have a relationship with me. Bring them to me because I want them to be my little disciples. May God bless you. Amen.